I'm joined by Michael McDowell, the grandson of Owen McNeil, and by Conor Mulva of the School of History and Archives at UCD, who are here to assess his legacy. Michael, first of all, how was your grandfather and his role in the revolutionary period described to you, represented to you, when you were growing up? Well, I was uh, born in 1951 and Owen McNeil had died in 1945, so I was uh, that was six years before my birth. But uh, in the house, uh, he was obviously regarded with great affection by my mother. And he was at that stage seen as a person um, who, according to the national mythology, which Fianna Fáil were dominantly in charge of, was somebody who simply cancelled, uh, called off 1916. And uh, he tended to be uh, with Collins and others who didn't fit into the uh, mainstream orthodoxy of, uh, of events, uh, downplayed as a character. And uh, there was a, an element of defensiveness about him uh, within the family, you know, that there was another side of the story which wasn't being told. And it really only um, uh, emerged in the uh, context of the, na- the 50th anniversary of 1916. Yeah, I was going to ask in, you, because it must have been interesting from a family point yeah. of view how he was represented. Um, well, that. I mean, he was, he was represented uh, um, a, 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 in an RTE documentary um, as, a, as, a, as a bit of a hothead kind of uh, individual which caused a bit of dismay in the family since he was a very phlegmatic individual. But it was only at that stage that people like F.X. Martin and uh, uh, Father Frank Shaw started to write articles saying that there was far more to MacNeil uh, than he was being given credit for and they published his memoranda and his justifications for his actions both uh, prior to 1916 and during 1916 at that time, and it was from then on that he, that I suppose his rehabilitation as a serious historical figure began. Um, Connor, before he wrote The North Began for Aunt Clive Sullish in November 1913, would McNeil have been seen primarily as a cultural nationalist? Absolutely. I think McNeil's entry into politics was through the Gaelic League, and this is where I, I really have, I've read up in this in the last while, I've seen some very interesting parallels between himself and Pierce and their trajectory through the Gaelic League into flirtations with physical force, let's say, because the the problem with the 1916 rising and all that preceded it is that we look at the 1913 period now through an oversimplified prism and we don't necessarily see the the difficulties of that period, the intricacies of it. And there are figures in 1913 who were already wiped off the political map by the time the dust settles uh, on Easter week 1916. So, In that sense, we're looking back at a very different McNeil. And I think that's the McNeil that maybe this evening we might get Mm. to to play out, uh, the McNeil of 1913. Okay, let's concentrate just for a moment on the article on The North Began, Michael. What's the argument of McNeil in that pivotal article and why do you think it made such a profound impression? Well, the argument in the in the uh, article was that um, the uh, assertion by the Ulster volunteers of their right to mobilise and to arm in, in defence of their views, gave a huge opportunity to Nationalist Ireland to do the same. And the implication of the article was that if this was all right with the British government and the Tory establishment and um, the establishment in the United Kingdom, well, then there was a huge opportunity for Nationalist Ireland to do the same thing. And uh, if they were, wouldn't put down the... Uh, the Ulster Volunteers, as they couldn't after the mur- uh, Curragh mu- Mutiny, that now was uh, now was the opportunity to mobilise um, a, a counter force in the rest of Ireland, if you like, uh, to take on the argument that uh, self-government was something which could be uh, asserted by a force of numbers using an armed force. And this feeds into uh, Professor Michael Laffin's call for a statue to be erected, Connor, to Edward Carson as one of the founders of the, the, the Irish Free State. But why McNeil? I mean, did he choose to write this article or was it foisted upon him? I think that's the, the really difficult question within this. It's whether McNeil was a player or a pawn in this game. And one of the big problems is that what we're dealing with here is the history of secret organisations, particularly the Irish Republican Brotherhood. In dealing with the Irish Republican Brotherhood, we have very few written records, particularly of their meetings and of primary sources. And as well, most of the figures who were elemental and and seminal to this whole movement uh, were either dead or written out of the picture by 1916. So we have very few written records and the ones we do have are conflicting. So we have great difficulty. But one of the stories I I like from this period, um, and we might discuss its veracity or not, is that 
apparently Owen McNeil was suffering from a bit of a Halloween flu um, in late October 1913 and he was confined to bed. He lived on 19 Herbert Park Road and the O'Rahilly lived in number 40. So the O'Rahilly, who was the editor of Clive Sullis, the newspaper of the Gaelic League, uh, simply strolled down to McNeil's house and said, McNeil, I hear you're held up with a flu. I've been thinking about getting someone to write an article about all these volunteer movements and what are the nationalists going to respond to Edward Carson in the north. Would you think about writing one? And the, so the lore goes that McNeil had very little excuse because he was bed bound and he had very little else on his desk. So Does that sound plausible, Michael? Well, I, I mean, <laughs> there certainly was a close relationship between himself and O'Reilly because they were collaborating in, in publishing uh, on Clive Sullish. And definitely uh, McNeil acknowledges that uh, O'Reilly raised the issue with them. Uh, whether whether he was um, uh, a total uh, pawn of, of O'Reilly's, I don't. I wouldn't go that far. But I would say though that uh, that he he later in a memorandum about his own uh, activities at the time claimed that he knew that this approach was being made uh, by people who were not of the uh, Redmondite tradition, if I might put it that way, and he knew that there were people uh, who were anxious that there should be um, a force created, a counter force that the UVF created, and that he wasn't a naive uh, university professor who didn't know what he was doing writing an article, that he knew very well mm. that there was this um, physical force group I who were anxious to um, have somebody of his standing um, spe speak up for the proposition. I think that's the, the strange part of the narrative because McNeil in his own writings, and particularly in one memoir in 1932, yeah. admits that he knew who he was dealing with and how potent the fire that he was he was essentially sticking his hand into was O'Rahley wasn't really the, the dangerous player here O'Rahley wasn't in the IRB at this yeah. point he was essentially another cultural nationalist who was maybe a little more enamoured of the physical force tradition Exactly because the, in 1916 yeah. O'Rahley actually collaborates with MacNeil in trying to call it off and then very nobly decides to throw, decides his, hand to throw his hand in and, and his motor dies. car yeah, yes, <laughs> his motor which car was his pride and joy and he dies, drove it into dies a barricade exiting yeah. the, uh, the GPO but unlike a lot of barstool revolutionaries Conor McNeil goes further than simply writing about mm. the notion of shadowing the UVF in what might be called nationalist art he becomes centrally involved then in the organisation that he had himself conceived Absolutely and this is where another player in the story comes in and I think the, the central player possibly because he's one of the people who has the most comprehensive written record of the period so we have to take it with a grain of salt but that's Bulmer Hobson almost a neighbour of McNeil's in terms of his birthplace they both come from the glens of Antrim uh, Bulmer Hobson is up the Quaker stock and Hobson is training behind the scenes he's a, he's a senior member of the IRB he's essentially revamped the IRB since 1905 and Hobson's the one who goes to a rally after the North began is published and said I like the look of that article. That said a lot of things that resonated with me. Now, what even O'Reilly didn't know at this point was that uh, Hobson had been secretly drilling members of the IRB in 41 Parnell Square and also at a rifle range out at Harold's Cross throughout the summer of 1913. And as such, Hobson was just waiting for the moment to pounce. And in McNeil, this is again where we come back to the player or pawn question. What he found in McNeil was the perfect figurehead for a movement. McNeil had credibility. He was a moderate and now he had stepped outside his moderate shoes and written this article, which for all intents and purposes was a call to arms, a call to emulate Carsonism and in a sense hold out an olive branch to Carsonism that they could form an all-island, all-Ireland um, volunteer movement that would oppose the British volunteers, which is who he identifies in the North Began as the primary enemy in this. So, uh, uh, Michael, was was your grandfather, was Owen McNeil prepared to take things, though, to a violent conclusion if that was how events turned out? So, I mean, And also, what do you read into his opposition to Redmond's attempt to take over the, the control of the volunteers in 1914 when the organisation split in two unequal parts? Well, those are two different questions. Mm. Dealing with the first one, his attitude towards force, he was prepared in the ultimate, intellectually, to uh, uh, go along with the use of force. Provided had the weapons been landed in 1916 he would have supported or thrown well, in his... Well, uh, well, that's not necessarily so, but, he, right. but, but he, would have, he would have... His view was that force was legitimate uh, and that the Irish uh, independence cause was a legitimate for, um, movement which could eventually use force if absolutely necessary, um, but it had to have a prospect of success. And what he did is... One of his big things was in early 1916 when he detected what Pierce was uh, planning, which was a kind of a blood sacrifice coup, which uh, was just, uh, you know, drenched the land of Ireland with the blood of martyrs. When he realised that that's what Pierce was doing, he wrote a very cogent memorandum to him, 
uh, and to members of the volunteer executive saying that that was not in his view legitimate, that uh, force had to have some prospect of success, that Ireland wasn't Roisin Dove, it wasn't... Uh, Which ironically Kat- was the Rooney. IRB position as well, because uh, even though Pierce was a member of the IRB, he was part of an elite within the IRB and uh, the likes of Hobson would have been opposed to that's, exactly That's right, and, 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 and Hobson, uh, who later took a slightly jaundiced view of McNeil, Hobson actually collaborated with McNeil in trying to stop the 1916 Rising. Hobson was kidnapped by his fellow IRB members and um, whereas McNeil managed by November 1917 to rehabilitate himself, rejoin uh, the, the, the national movement, if you like, and uh, headed the, the poll for the national executive, the Art Corley of Sinn Féin, when Michael Collins got the last seat, Bulmer Hobson was regarded uh, by everyone as suspect and I think he resented the fact that McNeil didn't pull him up into the movement and ho- hold on to him. Tell us then, Connor, what happened in the lead-up to the 1916 Rising and the part that he played. Uh, well, essentially, skipping forward from the 1913 yeah. uh, stuff that we're commemorating today into, into the 1916 Rising, as the IRB's elaborate plans involving money from America, arms from Germany, aid from Germany, uh, Roger Casement raising an Irish brigade which was initially planned to be a grand invasion force into Ireland and essentially devolved into farce um, at various points. McNeil is told during Easter week itself of what's actually going to happen on Easter week and that there's a force coming from Germany, that there's an all-Ireland rising being planned in the spirit of 1798 that there's going to be an invasion there's going to be forces just like what landed at Kalala and he said you need to be behind this or or else you need to um i suppose shut up and he he basically says that I'm going to countermand this. I don't think this is safe. The only way that I would support a rising is if the arms are about to be taken off the volunteers or if an immediate threat to conscription uh, was about to occur. So, And knowing that was his mm. position, Pierce and the others actually at one stage fabricated a document. The uh, Castle document. The exactly. Castle document suggesting that the British were about to disarm the volunteers in order to push McNeil to the logic of his own position and say, you, you, are you now w- willing to use defensive force to keep the uh, uh, volunteers armed. You talked about his rehabilitation as opposed to the non-rehabilitation of Hobson. How did he manage to bring that about well, and two still things, be a player? Two things. While the 1916 uh, Rising was in progress, his home was up in Woodtown Park in Rathfarnham. And towards the end of it, he went in and surrendered himself to the uh, British forces who were uh, then establishing martial law. For his trouble, he was arrested and tried for effectively uh, sedition under the um, Defence of the Realm Act. And he was given a general court martial and sentenced to penal servitude for life in 1916. So he was sent to Dartmoor uh, as a prisoner and um, he was the commander in chief of the volunteers at the time. And uh, by that process, he was he effectively became party to the uh, aftermath of 1916. And when all the prisoners were uh, released in 1917, there was a big effort by people like Mrs. Tom Clark and Margaret Pierce and others to uh, reject McNeil as, as a, some kind of a, a Lundy or a traitor. And De Valera, in fairness to him, stood up for McNeil and said uh, no, that he was he was somebody they wanted to keep in the movement. And as a result of that, and his general kind of uh, high standing, um, he, as I said, headed the poll in the election for the Sinn Féin Art Corla in 1917. And was elected to the first Thal in 1918, Connor, and approved, or seems to have approved, of the involvement of his three sons in the IRA. Absolutely. And uh, just to go back to, to Michael's point about his, his rehabilitation after the rising, De Valera really is central. And there's, there's two anecdotes that we have on this. One is that when he was actually in the, the prison camps after the 1916 rising, apparently the other volunteers were set to kill him because mm. he, they blamed him for the failure of the rising. They said if this rising had gone off on Sunday, as opposed to the half-cocked Monday rising that we had, we would have stand it, standed a chance. And essentially that's it's not factually correct if we can look yeah. into the history of it but they were still enraged at, at um, McNeil and it was De Valera who talked down the Irish volunteers and said listen this guy isn't one of the bad guys he's actually one of us and then going back to the 
the release afterwards, there's a brilliant photo in, it's actually recently been digitised in UCD's digital collections of McNeil and De Valera sitting beside each other with their prison haircuts outside the mansion house in 1917, uh, arm in arm, smirking with each other. And I, I could never really reconcile this photo with my later understanding of where De Valera and McNeil stood on the political spectrum. But it was that sense that De Valera had identified in McNeil someone who could elevate him and vice versa, McNeil had found in De Valera, um, let's say, a political wing to shelter under while the, the storms of 1917 were playing out against him. During the Civil War, Michael, he took a very strong line on the execution of Republican prisoners. Yet his own son chose the Republican side in the uh, the conflict, Breen well, McNeil. Well, he had three sons, Turlock, Brian and Neil, uh, who were in the uh, IRA in South Dublin. And they were very active. During the War of Independence. During the War of Independence. And they were very active. And, and uh, McNeil's house in uh, Netley on Cross Avenue was a safe house and the arms dump for the, for the, for the area. And it was raided several times by the uh, Black and Tans and they never actually found uh, the, the dump which was well concealed in the, in, in, in the kitchen. So, I mean, he knew what was going on and he did. He, it wasn't just the early fairy academic who was uh, sort of above it all. Uh, he was taking a huge risk because that would have been a very serious matter if they'd been discovered. The other thing that uh, recently was discovered by um, an archivist in the Tuam Archdiocese was a letter he wrote um, to the Archbishop of Tuam who had um, condemned the British forces burning of uh, the centre of Tuam as a reprisal for the shooting of some RIC men. And he said no no murder, no matter how dastardly, would justify such a burning. And McNeil was a very devout Catholic and wrote to him and really took him on and said it was not a dastardly murder to shoot the RIC men. There is a, a, a war going on in this country and um, IRA volunteers are to be shot on sight. And effectively he said to the Archbishop of Tuam, you'd better work out which side you're on the right of the Irish to bear arms or the right of the British to use arms against the Irish in the country. So he, he actually signed on for the War of Independence big time. I think this is this is one of the key things about assessing McNeil's personality and let's say his political modus operandi, that he fluctuates between misadventure and taking very hard stances on things. The yeah. two things that McNeil can be credited for are the countermanding order where he certainly shows that he's not merely a puppet to the IRB or anyone else and he takes a very decisive stand. And the second time that he plays a very hardball game is when he comes out as one of the strongest proponents of the execution policy during the Civil War. A controversial policy, I know, but certainly we can't say it's anything but hard. Meanwhile, on the soft side of things and where McNeil, let's say, bungles a little bit, is first of all in underestimating his sometime allies, sometimes opponents in the Irish Volunteers in 1913, where he's yeah. simply not prepared for the level of IRB interference. And then secondly, with the Boundary Commission, which I think if we're talking about the legacy of McNeil is going to be one of his other crowning uh, legacies. OK, we'll come back to the Boundary Commission mm, yes. in, in just a minute. But I want to talk about the death of Brian McNeil and the attitude of his father towards the execution of Republican prisoners, because it would appear and... This is something that you've discussed yourself in your your own TV documentary, that Breed McNeil was extra judicially executed, that he was dispatched, that he wasn't just killed in action. So, in effect, what happened to him was uh, something that his own father perhaps would have approved of. No, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think that, in fact, uh, McNeil, uh, Owen McNeil was told a very kind of sanitised version of what happened to Brian and the McNeil family chose to accept that at the time. They were told by Free State officers that there'd been a firefight and that their son had this died... This is in Sligo. ...on the top of Ben Bulban in 1922 and that their son had died a noble death in the middle of a firefight. And they wanted to believe that and they had no reason to disbelieve it uh, initially, although they got a lot of correspondence from local people in Sligo who told them that this was all wrong. And he certainly wouldn't have uh, wished uh, his own son to be shot down in those circumstances. But that's in uh, September 1922. Uh, fast forward to uh, December 1922. Sean Hales, TD, and um, Ernie O'Malley, uh, Patrick O'Malley, uh, TD, are leaving the uh, Ormond Hotel in Ormond Quay and Republican gunmen sh shoot them. Uh, and one of them is killed, the other survives. And that afternoon, the Free State or the Provisional Government's Cabinet uh, meets and they decide if they start shooting RTDs, we're finished because uh, our legitimacy will be gone. So they take the remarkable step of just simply uh, directing the governor of, of Mount Joy Prison to take out four leading Republican prisoners the following morning and to shoot them by firing squad without trial. And that's Rory, Liam, Dick and Joe, including Rory O'Connor, Kevin O'Higgins' best man. And McNeil and 
others, including Kevin O'Higgins, were the hardliners on that. They said, you know, we have to act now to save the provisional government and uh, we have to show these people we will fight fire with fire. Mm. Now, lawyers throw up their hands in horror at that, but uh, their view was this is effective. Mm. I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point and it, it brings us back to the fact that McNeil in himself almost gives us a microcosm of the revolutionary decade because what we have is he's almost a prisoner of his own logic. He advocates the use of the gun in 1913 and by forcing himself to live by his own logical statements, he finds himself at the point in 1922-23 where he's advocating um, reprisal killings and essentially he's, he's advocating a policy that leads to the death of one of his own sons. And it shows just how difficult that trajectory was in Irish history, how it tore families apart and how innocently Irish people entered into that whole realm of, of thinking in 1913. These were grown men who were playing at soldiers, carrying wooden sticks, mm. standing like the O'Rahilly in their garden with uh, rifles posing for photographs and not really understanding the logical conclusion of where they were going with that. And I, I think, again, bringing this back to the start of the revolutionary decade where we are now, we're looking at a period where they're facing into a real and present threat of civil war by July 1914. Okay, let's finish with the with his involvement in the Boundary Commission, Michael, which was supposed to, from a nationalist point of view, supposed to redesign the border and, in theory, to leave nothing but a rump Northern Ireland state which would be incapable of economic survival. That was the, well, that uh, was the, the logic. Ba- that was the basis on which the treaty was sold yeah. to the Irish people and the Boundary Commission was represented to the Irish people. But anybody who, I think, reads Ronan Fanning's great book, The Fatal Path, now knows that there was no prospect of that Boundary Commission doing anything significantly different from what it did, which is uh, tweaking the border between six counties and 26 counties. But McNeil, um, he did two things which I think uh, were very difficult for his colleagues in Cabinet to accept. Uh, Number one, he took uh, his duty of confidentiality far too seriously. And his brother James, who was the High Commissioner in London, was trying to eke some information out of him as to where, where the whole process was going. And secondly, he was, I think, a bit trusting of the chairman and the uh, British government representative on it uh, when, it, when he oughtn't to have been. But he may have come to the conclusion, in fairness to him, that uh, this was what was going to happen. And he may have co- come to the view, as an Ulster man, that a six-county Ulster was a better thing than a four-county Ulster in his own mind. And uh, that in the last analysis, that the Catholics in Northern Ireland would be better served by a larger Ulster than a smaller well, one. I'd, I'd ignore the fact that a former Minister for Justice, I suspect, has just suggested that somebody should have leaked. Uh, <laughs> we will, we will move, move beyond that. Finally, uh, Connor, pawn or player? I think McNeil. what Michael has just said leads us nicely to a, a concluding point and an assessment of McNeil. And that's the question. Was he an academic who was ultimately outfoxed by politicians? He was outfoxed by um, conspirators in 1913 with the Irish Volunteers. And by 1925, I would argue that the enemy in the Boundary Commission wasn't so much his fellow commissioners as his fellow cabinet ministers who sold him into a very difficult situation where he was trying to be the first minister for education on one hand and on the other hand, a boundary commissioner. And it was simply an unattainable task there's that a, he was set up for a fall. There's a very sort of uh, poignant scene that Kevin O'Higgins is gunned down by Republican gunmen again in, in um, Booterstown and McNeil is the first person to find him there. And the funny thing is that McNeil really didn't have a huge empathy for Kevin O'Higgins and he believed that Kevin O'Higgins had isolated him on the Boundary Commission and set him up a little bit for that. But, I mean, if you, if you, if you try to define McNeil in, in relation to calling off the 1916 revolution and the Boundary Commission, I think you ignore the broader thing, and that is that he was a, a figure who set in motion with Douglas Hyde the whole nationalist revival, that he um, did play the role he played in The North Began, that he was the editor and all the rest of it of uh, on Thogluck, the, the volunteer magazine right up to 1916, and that he got stuck back into the War of Independence and the Sinn Féin movement thereafter. He isn't an unalloyed political success, I'll concede that, but uh, he's not by no means a failure. Michael McDowell and Conor Mulva, thank you very much. 